Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Radiator Comics Studio. Thank you so much for joining us today um, to for Nuts and Bolts writing with Yasmin Omar Atta, um, Remus Jackson, and Jared Rosello. Uh, Nuts and Bolts is a series of presentations by cartoonists with connections to South Florida about different aspects of comics making. Um, tonight, we're talking about writing. Uh, it's part of a larger series of online programs and print publications uh, called Radiator Comics Studio, which are all designed to support and grow the cartooning community in South Florida and connect it with the national comics scene. Um, Radiator Comics Studio is made possible with support from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and we're grateful for their support, as well as the support of Oolite Arts and the Miami Foundation. My name is Neil Brideau. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his and I run Radiator Comics, which when we're not doing events like this, uh, we're distributing self-published and small press comic books. Um, we are broadcasting tonight uh, from Miccosukee, Tequesta and Seminole land. It's important to acknowledge that the land on which we live and work is stolen land and the people from whom the land was stolen are still here and still caring for the land. Um, it's also important to acknowledge uh, the stolen labor of African American, Bahamian, Haitian, and other Caribbean people that was used to build South Florida into what we know it to be today. Um, this history is not ancient history. It's still very present today, and it's really important to address. Um, we all have a lifelong responsibility to be better caretakers of the land on which we live, um, to dismantle white supremacy, and be better community members and neighbors to the people around us. Um, and we think that expressing one's ideas and feelings through comics and zines can be really powerful. Uh, and one of our hopes with programming like this um, is to make those tools more accessible um, for folks. And we hope that this might inspire more people to join in on the conversation and um, express their ideas. Uh, so we're really grateful to have you all here tonight for um, three presentations on writing techniques and, and practices, followed by a conversation and questions um, from you if you have them. This is our seventh Nuts and Bolts event and the second to focus on writing. Um, writing is such a critical and, and fascinating uh, component of comics making um, that we thought it would be great um, to, to revisit this topic. Um, and you can view the first uh, writing nuts and bolts on our YouTube page. Please don't go there now, because um, right now we have three fantastic presentations um, from three fantastic comics artists. All three of these artists have made comics that have made me laugh, uh, that have moved me, that have made me really um, think and reflect uh, long after I've, I've read their comics. Um, so it's a real privilege to have them all here tonight. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll be presenting, and then I'll hand the mic over to them. Uh, each presentation is approximately 10 minutes long, and then after which uh, that will we'll open it up to, to conversation and questions. Um, and yeah, should be really good. So um, our first presenter will be Remus Jackson. Uh, Remus is a genderqueer cartoonist and PhD student in English at the University of Florida. Their work explores trans and disabled embodiment and desire. Their comic, See Me, was awarded a 2019 PRISM Award um, for Best Short Form Comic. They also co-host the comics podcast, Drawing a Dialogue. So welcome, Remus. Um, following Remus will be Yasmin Omar Atta. Um, Yasmin is a Middle Eastern and Muslim comics artist, game developer, and illustrator who creates art about coping with illness, uh, understanding identity, dismantling oppressive structures and Islamic futurism. They are currently working on two books with Viking books, the first of which uh, is set to be released in fall of 2021. Um, Yasmin is an Ignatz Award winner and Excellence in Graphic Literature Award finalist who has worked with clients and groups such as PEN America, Le Institut de Mon Arabe, uh, Palestine International, Big Mouth Comics, College Humor, OR Books, and more. So welcome, Yasmin. And then our final presenter uh, for the evening will be Jared Rosello. Jared is a Cuban-American writer, 
cartoonist and teacher. He is the author of the graphic novels Red Panda and Moon Bear and The Well-Dressed Bear Will Never Be Found. Jared holds an MFA in creative writing and a PhD in curriculum and instruction, both from Penn State University, um, originally from Miami. He now lives in Tampa, Florida with his family and teaches in the creative writing program at the University of South Florida. So welcome, Jared. Welcome to all three of you. Um, I am now going to hand the mic over to Remus. Hi, all right. Um, so like Neil said, my name is Remus. I use um, they or he pronouns. I am a PhD student and the University of Florida's English program. I also have a master's in English from UF um, in addition to comic stuff, which I mentioned only because I teach writing and I feel like that's a relevant context to talking about writing. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and share this little slideshow. And I'm gonna um, Google, uh, Google Slides has a thing that lets you do live captioning. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on and hopefully it'll work. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, this drawing is a little Tezuka a, a, a drawing that I think is really funny and appropriate for what we're doing, what I wanted to talk about. Um, and second of all, what I wanted to talk about is like writing, when Neil first approached me about this, honestly, it was like, I had to talk to some, I had to talk to my friend about whether I was going to say yes or not, because writing is an interesting thing for me where it's actually maybe the most difficult thing in the world for me to do, um, which is a little ironic because uh, I'm an English student and I teach writing. Um, and both of my chosen career paths involve a lot of writing, um, but I'm I'm a neurodivergent person. Um, I'm like somewhere on the spectrum, like ADHD, that kind of thing. Um, and I have um, a, just different like body mind realities that make writing very sort of difficult for me in a way that drawing and talking aren't. Um, so I wanted to sort of think about how could I use this to talk about um, uh, um, what I would call like a more crypt out writing practice, right? Like something, something like for, what for me is like, like the ways I have sort of found to um, write as a person who can't do the like cute, like, every day you sit down and write for an hour, no matter what kind of thing, right? Not that that's necessarily bad advice, but not everyone can do that, right? Because brains are all different. Um, so I wanted to actually start with a quote from a really important book called Care Work by um, Leia Lakshmi um, Pipesna Samaransina, um, which I'm just gonna go ahead and read, which is uh, chronic illness sucks, but Oh, there is the secret bliss of bed. Chronic illness may not have made me a writer, but it illuminates my writing life. I can't work a nine to five. The times I tried left me winded in bed after three days. But bedtime means a lot of dream time. And I wanted to start with this because something I've sort of spent the last year um, grappling with and getting more comfortable with, and I talked about this actually a little bit if you were at the story development one or if uh, Nuts and Bolts, or if you go back and look at the story development, nuts and bolts I mentioned like I'm trying to figure out how to like be sustainable in my practice and so this is where I've come to right um which is like sort of learning how to embrace um thinking about writing in a way that it starts from what's sustainable for me as a person with chronic health stuff and as a person with neurodivergence right and thinking about the importance of dream time um, which is what I'm going to talk about a lot and I like drawing blood from a stone is I, I always, the way I describe, the way I like, I've always tried to just felt like describing writing is that it's a lot like drawing blood with this from a stone. Cause I have so much like um, executive dysfunction around the process, right? It's not, whenever I say like, oh, I can't write. People are like, no, you're a good writer. And I'm like, no, I'm a great writer. <laughs> when I say I can't write, what I mean is it's difficult for me to do physically. <laughs> um, so my this sort of crypt out practice right that i'm sort of talking about it starts from how do i think and express my thoughts and this is something that i also tell my students to think about right because not everyone thinks the same way um so some people think in words some people think in pictures some people think in sound or shape um so i'm personally a very sort of kinesthetic and visual thinker i think in texture um and in layers and not so much in words um some of the way I think is very sort of loose and free form and unstructured, right? Um, I'm not a very, I'm, I'm not like a, a, a person who 
um, can sort of just like sit down and like do stuff, right? I sort of have to like map it out in a weird way. Um, in terms of sustainability, right? So stuff that's really important to me is sleep. Um, I, I, I go to bed at 10 every night. Like I have like a very strict sleep like routine. Um, dream time, which I, is what I, I pulled from that uh, Leia, Leia quote, right? The idea of like, even if you, giving yourself like the space to like lay down and rest and think and like that thinking is really important to me. I'm the kind of person who needs to have like a few months of thinking before I even get to the point of wanting to start to write um, just because I sort of need time to really process and chew things over and talk about stuff. Um, working in small chunks, right? Like not, I'm not, I'm not great. I'm not like the kind of person who can do the sustained like six hours a day of working. Um, having like a stable routine um, in, in non-pandemic times, leaving my apartment is a really huge thing for me because I'm not great at working from home. Um, not very, not a thing I can do right now, right? Not great to go outside. Uh, so I've been trying to find other ways to accommodate that, but it's good to know in the not pandemic times, right? Um, and something else that's really important to me is talking actually, like a huge part of my writing process is talking. Um, I'm a better talker than I am like writer when I'm thinking about stuff. Um, so I do a lot of talking with my friends. I have a couple of friends who are like my go-to buddies when I have a story idea where I'll just be like, hey, can you like, I was thinking about this and does this sound like a good idea? And like, so we'll like work together sort of on the same projects for a long time. Um, and they'll help me with that. I talk to like friends. Um, I have an agent who is amazing and who I love. And so I talk to her about my ideas. I talk to them about my ideas. Um, so, um, and then also knowing what tools work best for you as like a person, right? Cause some people are, word is all they need and they're off to the races. And then some people need um, stuff that's different, right? And again, it sort of all comes back to like how your brain works. So for me, I use a program called Scrivener. Um, I also mentioned that in the story development app uh, uh, talk which I, I like Scrivener because it's it feels closer to um, like an actual notebook than like a Word doc, which feels very like flat and sterile to me. Um, I also, uh, I have the kind of brain where I can't use the same thing forever because if it's not like novel, it stops being stimulating and then I will forget about it and never do it again. So I have to switch around a lot. So I also write a lot in my iPhone notes app. Um, I have a little keyboard for my iPad and sometimes I work on that. Um, I don't handwrite stuff very often, even when I'm planning, because I don't handwrite as fast as I think. And so it just sort of frustrates me. Um, and sometimes none of these things work. And that's when I sort of go back to dream time and the project slows down or moves slower or um, a lot, again, like part of this sustainable practice was, it has been for me like learning that it's okay to not move as quickly as I want, like writing, I think people often talk about writing in a way where like, oh, it's the fastest part of making a comic. And part of that is because of the way that the um, industry pipeline works if you're doing monthlies, right? So writers generally get a shorter turnaround time and are often also writing a bunch of things at once. And also like, yeah, like if you like map the hours, technically it usually takes longer to draw something than it takes to write it because drawing like physically, right? Drawing requires a certain amount of time. Um, but for me, writing actually takes the longest because I have to work through sort of the way my brain works to get to the part that's actually kind of easy for me, which is the drawing part. And then that tends to go a little bit faster. Um, so sort of inversing the way I think about that relationship has been a huge part of how I write. So I wanted to give a couple of like tiny examples um, to show also like, again, sort of all this in process. So this one is a script I wrote for what am I, um, I do these Jughead zines, which are like um, layered mediations on embodiment through the Riverdale characters. Um, and this one actually, I, this is a script that I wrote in my iPhone notes at like midnight as I was falling asleep. Um, and this is all I wrote and this is what I took to the final. So in this one, I didn't necessarily write like a very polished script, right? But I just had this idea and it like kind of snapped together and I was like, okay, done. And the part that mattered was sort of these lines, the specifically you're a sad sack and you fetishize being sad. And that was all I needed. And then um, that translated into these pages where you can see that like I, first, this is a short comic and often for very small things like that where it's contained enough that um, I don't need necessarily like a big roadmap. My writing is a lot more just like, 
here's important beats or like here's a couple of lines that I really want to hit or like here's the image that's really important um which in this case was it's Cheryl and Jughead on the roof smoking um and and then I, I sort of just work it out as I'm drawing instead so I do and I and I do this even in longer projects I tend to rewrite dialogue when I'm drawing just because once I start again I'm visual so once I sort of start drawing I'm like oh actually it would make more sense if they said this or whatever um but I also wanted to share a little bit of like what a longer, more sustained project looks like. Uh, so this is um, very early drafting from the comic I've been working on as a pitch. Um, so this isn't like still in the pitching phase, no idea what's gonna happen to it, but it, I've been writing it for a couple of years. And I wanted to sort of show like my early process of writing, um, no matter what I'm doing is pretty consistently like just trying to like get stuff down. So a scene ideas that are really important to me or like um, images that are really important again or dialogue. So you can see there's like this possible scenes where I'm just sort of writing stuff down. Um, and then more outlining, this is from like a few years later, um, like a rewrite of it where I was trying to actually put things in order. But again, still this like very like pared down, just like key ideas, right? Um, and then I, the reason I want to show this is because this is like one of very few like writing projects I've been working on where it's actually going through all these different phases of like scenes and then an outline and then a polished script, right? Because I'm showing it to another human being um, to try to get them to give me money for it. Um, so then I have, I move into like this, uh, this sort of outlining process, which is again, sort of like, um, a little more polished than usual for me, right? And, and this is like a few drafts ago. So this, that's why I don't mind showing this too because it's like very different now. Um, but again, sort of loose and you can see like, I'm not capitalizing it. I'm not like super serious about it. I'm just trying to like get the stuff down and like scene workshop, right? Um, Cause to me, the structure is a little more important than the nitty gritty details. Um, Cause a lot of, again, even things like dialogue as long as you kind of have the general beats I'm the kind of person that can then um, fiddle with that later like I don't need uh, some people need like a really detailed roadmap and I'm like the kind of person that's more of a draw map leave blank spaces kind of person so even for something like this I still like to leave myself a little bit I, I, I guess I think about it in the same way that I think about um when I was in high school and the way I was taught to like ink was like you always leave enough so that the next step is still like you're still drawing and you're not just like meticulously tracing um, and I feel the same way about writing where I'm like, I always want to leave like a little bit to be filled in on the next stage, even if um, it's not exactly the same thing. And then I also wanted to show uh, it, it, when it comes to like, because I want to talk a little bit about like editing before I wind up. And so like, I do also use, this is why I like Scrivener, because you can sort of do this, this um, note card thing. Um, and again, I I'm, when I'm writing, I'm thinking about it in terms of like blocks, in terms of scenes, in terms of beats. So I, I can, for like, this is a big project, right? This is like a big book. So I can um, do this and then that way I can look at it and be like, oh, actually it makes more sense for this scene to be over here. And then I can just sort of like drag the note cards around and work on it that way um, instead of having to like copy and paste or rewrite a bunch of stuff. Um, so I just wanted to also briefly touch on revision and this is the, sorry, this is the English teacher in me coming out. Scriv yeah, Scrivener um i'll put it in the chat Oops, sorry i'll put it in the chat for everyone um so this and i'll be done after this i just wanted to sort of the english teacher in me is like we never teach people how to revise things so again um dream work and getting feedback from friends and colleagues um writing groups if you can like make a writing group um which the way you make a writing group by the way is just by asking like three of your friends to commit to write stuff with you it's do it but whoever right get feedback from people don't be afraid to cut stuff but what I always do whenever I cut things is I save it in a different file so I can go back to it if I decide I actually want it back um generate some sort of like pitch or prospectus or just like a paragraph that's like your core ideas what you're really trying to hit so that if you're working on something for a long time and editing it you can come back to it um it's helpful in that way you don't like because I get lost in the weeds sometimes, especially if it's been months and then I'm like, oh no, I forget what I'm trying to even say here. Um, structural edits, big picture over small picture, all, um, but also like jump around and do what makes sense for you. Because again, there's no one way to do anything. And the best way, honestly, to like get a feel for this stuff is just to experiment with a bunch of different things and figure out what works for you as a person. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was really fantastic.
Um, I love, I feel like, you know, one of the, like, the big things that like people are always wondering is like, what's the, like the right way to like, to write a comic. And so it's really great to have a presentation where it's like the right way is the, the way that works for you. Um, and that's- I tell this to my kids every semester and every semester they're like, no, but you have to tell us how to do it. And I'm like, I can't answer that for you. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Cool, thank you so much, Remus. That was really fantastic. Um, so our next presenter is Yasmin, and we'll hand the mic over to them. Hello. Um, thank you, Remus. That was awesome. Um, and thank you, Neil, for having us on the panel. Uh, my name is Yasmin Omar Ada. Um, you might also know me as Delta or Delta Head on the internet. Um, I, my pronouns are they, them, and Neil did an awesome job of uh, introducing me already. So I'm just gonna get right into it. So here we go. <laughs> As Rima said, there's always the question of the right way to write comics. And like they said, it, there's nothing, you know, there's no right way to do it. So here's the way that I do it. All right. So you have this cool idea. You got your cool idea. You got how sees. You're like, wow, sick, cool. Um, and then it's like, okay, now it's time to actually start making it once you have your ideas, right? But whenever it's time to start writing a comic, everyone always tells you that you need a script. And <laughs> it makes sense. It's a great way to write a comic. It's awesome. It's a great way to write a tight comic. Um, but unfortunately, what if your brain doesn't work that way? My brain doesn't work that way. And the instant that I'm like, okay, I gotta sit down and write a script, brain becomes smooth. So it's really hard because you'll sit in front of a laptop for hours making no progress. Um, you know, before the pandemic, I would sit in a coffee shop trying to write a script and I would literally just sit there like this in a public place, not doing anything, not making any progress. Um, and through that, I learned that there's actually a lot of ways to make this work. So here's the one that works for me. Um, so I start by writing all of my ideas onto post-it notes and then picking whatever wall in my apartment has the right free space or like the, like the biggest like real estate. And I start uh, pressing all of those post-it notes onto the wall, sort of arranging them in a way that sort of like, you know, kind of starts to make sense. Uh, I have different colored post-it notes sort of for me to differentiate uh, scenes that um, like are more fully formed in my mind and scenes that are kind of like lobby, like scenes that I'm like, you know, this could change, um, but I'm not so sure. Um, so I have those rearranged on my wall. As you start doing that, you can kind of start to see spaces um, where there needs to be connective tissue um, because you're visualizing it. Um, on like a wall and like physically instead of, you know, just kind of vaguely in your mind palace. So I start doing that and I leave those blank spaces blank and don't try to fill them in quite yet. Um, just so I know, hey, these are places where things need to go. Then I take all those ideas and I start fitting them into an outline. I'm going to kind of go through really quickly the outline that I use when I kind of have to start fitting all these things together. Um, this is based off of KM Weiland's template. It's not the same, but it's kind of like, oh, you know, I put it together. So um, the way that I put this is act one is your first 25% of your story. You have your fun, cool setup stuff, right? But at some point, you know, towards the beginning, you kind of have to have your hook. It's an important scene that sort of reveals to the readers, like, this is an aspect of your story that's unique. This is something that shows the readers like, hey, I have this cool thing that I want you to find out about, but I'm just gonna hint towards it. Um, so you have that. After that, I have like the inciting event, which kind of kicks off the story and kind of starts like bringing things in, like, oh, stuff's gonna happen. Then you can have pretty much whatever you want, um, but something nice to tie in the first act and sort of differentiate it from the now beginning second act. Uh, act two, about 25% to 75% of your story. Some cool stuff, whatever you want. <laughs> I have all these holes that are like, just kind of do whatever you want. Um, at some point you have a first pinch point 
it kind of reminds the reader and your characters if they're not quite aware of it yet of your opposing forces presence or power over the story and just reminding them like hey this is there underneath the surface and it's going to come up at some point you can have a midpoint where this is kind of different for everybody but for me i like to be like storm is brewing things are gonna happen soon <laughs> then you can put some other fun stuff uh, there's a second pinch point where around this time your protagonist should be kind of taking some kind of action or have some kind of clear insight, knowing what's going on, building some tension, kind of hinting like, oh, you know, some things are going to kick off. And sometimes the reader can be like, oh, I know what's going to happen. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> then you, you know, for this kind of outline, you have act three, which is the last 25% of your story. Um, there's some cool stuff here. Get ready for the climax. Y'all know this is what everything has been leading up towards. This is the really dramatic part of your three act story. So everything is leading up to that. And then after that, you have some kind of resolution. For me, um, I tend to write a lot of feelings and not a lot of action. <laughs> so for me, this is kind of like an opportunity to sort of underline what the point of the story is, what the feelings are beneath the story and kind of just wrap up everything into a nice little package. So by putting what I already do have into this format, not only can I visualize better, like where again, the connective tissue is in this new form, but seeing everything all kind of lined up together, all things that you do already have, um, you can kind of get ideas for like what can connect the scenes and um, how things that you already have can be better. Um, even if, you know, it's kind of blobby and it's like, um, even just a couple sentences, at some point you're going to have a full enough outline that you can work off of, even if it's not like totally nice and tight. But that's great. I don't write a script. I don't write dialogue beforehand based off of this outline. I figure out what information needs to be conveyed uh, and then I keep that written down somewhere so I know. Or sometimes it kind of stays in my mind palace, whatever works. Um, there we go. Oh, for some reason, these aren't working. Cool. Just imagine that there's a thing there. Um, so using the outline and knowledge of what, um, like I know the characters are and the feelings that need to be conveyed in the scenes. Um, I thumbnail, but I thumbnail really big. And I make my thumbnails a bit more detailed and clearer than usual, which makes them double as rough pencils. Uh, layout is super important to me, so this part is big because I need to design everything along with the layout and with the dialogue instead of after the dialogue. I can't really separate, here's the outline, here's the thumbnails, uh, or script, here's the thumbnails, here's the pencils, here's the ink, here's the color. For me, it's not like that. My brain doesn't work that way. So I have to get everything synthesized and sort of growing along at the same time. Um, I'll try and show the uh, slides with the images after, um, for some reason in full screen, they're not loading. Let's see. Um, another thing, this is all for a, uh, for a three act structure. Um, but if you wanna try something that isn't a three act structure, I recommend trying what I like to call uh, Sloan Leung's botanical <laughs> theory of narrative, which I don't think there's, it's actually called that, but it's just something that me and Sloan have talked about um, as we're just hanging out and talking about narrative. Sloan Leong is great, wonderful author of A Map to the Sun and Prism Stalker. Please go read, they're amazing. Um, basically, our theory of narrative is to look at diagrams of leaves and nature and try to imagine how a story structure would play out if using those shapes applied to the narrative. You can look up diagrams of leaves and try out all kinds of fun stuff and combined with the writing um, that I just talked about and the method that I've sort of put together with uh, synthesizing everything as it goes along, uh, it can be very, very fun. So I hope that any of this has helped you. Good luck on making your comics. You can do it. Thank you. <laughs> I hope any of that has helped anybody uh, because it's just hard when your brain doesn't work a certain way and it's like, have a script and it's like I the brain does not does not work brain becomes smooth uh so sorry I can't full screen them but these are sort of like examples of this is a thumbnail and a pencil page for me like this is what it looks like 
Um, it's very rough. Sometimes I add filters and things like that um, just because it's fun and I like color, but these are basically what double as my thumbnails and my pencil. Uh, it can be hard because you're doing a lot of work um, what seems like upfront, but at the same time, it's your script, your thumbnails and your pencils all in one step. So it's not as intimidating as it might seem. For me, it's really great because I can see the whole thing all at once and through making a draft, it's easier for me to see what works and what doesn't and where I can rearrange things and things like that. So that's where I'm coming from with writing again. I hope this helps you in any possible way. And maybe this can help you sort of not only use an alternative, but also maybe come up with your own alternative to writing a script. Uh, let me stop screen sharing. <laughs> so that's all I got. Wow, that was really fantastic. I love um, <laughs> uh, that the, the, the plant narrative. Is oh, yes. Oh, let me show you real quick, real quick. So this is the diagram that I was talking about. Can I zoom? Um, this is basically a diagram of leaf shapes. And so it's like kind of cool. You can see how maybe this could be an interesting way to go about narrative. Like you have ones that taper off in the beginning, but then the story kind of goes more towards the end. You have this one, which I so really like, which is an even pinnate, which kind of spreads out all at once. So you can try a story that has multiple timelines or different universes and kind of string them along like that. So it's just interesting. It's a visual thing like that. The screen, I don't think, I don't know if other people can see it, but I can't see a, a shared screen. I don't know. If... Oh, my apologies. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, huh. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be uh, sharing very nicely. Technology. Yeah, you know, it's okay. Um, it doesn't have to be this diagram in particular. Um, you can just uh, look up leaf um, like diagrams and you can find some really interesting stuff and just keep in mind sort of narrative and how you can shape things like that. So I'm sorry that the diagram isn't uh, loading itself, but you know, just an idea. If you look them up, you might be able to get some ideas. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, great. And so uh, our, our final presenter for the evening is Jared Rosello. And so I'll pass the mic to Jared. Hi everybody, and Neil, thanks for um, for inviting me and for putting this together and for hosting this. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, um, and uh, thanks to Yasmin and Remus for their awesome presentations. One of the things I feel like um, was reinforced in both of your presentations was this idea that you should not work against your natural tendencies as a writer, and so not take that sort of like schematic of what you think a writer looks like and force yourself into it, but rather figure out how you write and do that the best way and sort of get something cool out of that. <clears throat> and that's, that I feel like that took me a really long time as a writer to kind of figure out, and especially as a cartoonist, which incorporates so many different elements and parts and pieces to it, um, that it can be kind of complicated to figure out what your process even is and for me anyway, from project to project, my process shifts and changes constantly. And so I will also share my screen uh, to walk you through some of these things. But um, when I do school visits and uh, and kids, usually for kids, because I, I write, I, I'm lately been making books for kids um, and they're asking me like, how did you get started telling stories or storytelling? Um, I usually start by telling them that I learned to tell stories by playing with action figures. And so um, one of the things that was really helpful for me was remembering that the writing process doesn't necessarily include just text, but that it's part of a kind of, especially in comics, part of a kind of a larger design process. If we were doing a talk on design for comics, I would be incorporating the writing of text into it because they, I sort of fold those things in together. And so, um, what you're looking at right now is sort of what I start with when I'm working on a book that's for like a uh, that I've pitched to a publisher and so uh, it'll include a sort of synopsis and so I begin with because you have to sort of write down well here's what my story is about and so um, I take each step of my writing process as a kind of challenge to future me to like okay it's your job later Jared to figure out how, what to do with this next um, so I start with a synopsis where I just I don't worry about what I can draw or whether or not this works I just sort of try to write 
write down something that I think would be interesting or fun or surprising. Um, and, I, and I don't at this stage wanna be thinking about anything visual, although I've certainly sketched out characters and thought about what my characters look like. Um, and these stories have kind of grown from character development, which is something that I would do would have spent probably years developing characters before I started writing stories featuring them. Um, so I start off with this synopsis um, of a chapter. And so here's the sort of basic over, uh, overview of what's gonna happen in this chapter. Um, from there, I will go and write a script. And you'll see that my script is basically just me writing down the dialogue. Here's one of the things that I learned about myself um, as a comics writer, similar to Yasmin, I don't like writing scripts, it feels really unnatural to me, um, but I learned that I'm better at writing dialogue when I type it out than when I try to handwrite it. And so I started just writing dialogue, just, just running pages of dialogue of characters talking, kind of skipping over the scenes, leaving sort of scene des descriptions out. Um, and then that sort of morphed into a kind of script writing process for myself where I was kind of organizing this comic because this comic includes a lot of dialogue. I was able to organize kind of early versions of the story around, um, around the dialogue. And so I'll write out the dialogue as you see it here. I'll, and I'll do this for the entire book all the way through. So this book's like 200 pages. Um, then I'll go print it out chapter by chapter and I'll sit down with my dialogue and just beside it, I'll do this quick little thumbnail breakdown, just starting to think about the natural beats and pauses within this scene. Um, and I'll start to sort of just sketch out an idea for a page. I'm not one of these people who can imagine so, an image in my mind and hold it there. I need to like have, I don't know what I'm drawing until I start making lines on a page. And so this is just a way for me to kind of quickly imagine what this page might look like. But again, I'm not sort of stuck or making that decision definitely for sure at this moment. I'm just giving myself something to work with. Um, and so the edits that I've made to the dialogue actually don't happen at this point, but I do number my dialogue so I don't have to rewrite it into my thumbnails. Um, then I'll go into my sketchbook and I'll do the page that's on the left, which is I take my script, I take my little thumbnail sketch of a page breakdown, and I do a sort of larger, more fleshed out version. And I'll probably do this as close to print size as possible so that I know exactly what's going to fit in each panel and what's going to look good. Um, and I'll, and this is the point where as I'm writing it out, um, I'll go back and edit my, my dialogue. And so I might realize that, oh, you know what, I can get a facial expression that's going to convey a lot of the ideas in this text in, in this word balloon. So I don't need the word balloon anymore. I can cut that out or, oh, in order to get all of this text in, I really need two panels here. But visually, I just don't like the way those two panels look. So I'll go back and think about, okay, is there something I can cut? Or can I make this shorter somehow? Or do I need to add something there? Um, and then I'll take my uh, quick, my quick rough thumbnail onto um, uh, this page I did on Clip Studio on an iPad, and then I'll redraw it. Um, this will eventually I'll ink directly over this and that will also be the final page. So it's a kind of messy sort of thumbnail pencil page. Um, and then I'll go in and the text that you see is just a font. I just sort of pick a font that I like the width of it so that I'll hand write over it, but it'll be neat. Um, but I'll just throw that in there now so that I know exactly how much space it's taking up and um, making sure that my plan kind of works but at each stage i'm making revisions i'm going back and deciding do i really need this does this work leaving notes for myself later on there are times where i'll script things and when i get to draw it i'm like there's no i just don't want to draw all these cars and so i'll just change the story at that moment because it just i just don't feel like drawing that and what was i thinking when i scripted this sort of thing and so um, but I like that kind of tension um, that comes in a comic. I like the sort of constraint-based work. Uh, that's all I have actually to share. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. If I know how, here we go. Yeah, um, and so I really like that comics is constraint-based. And so my process is, Oh, am I here? Are you seeing? Okay. And so I try to, again, because I like those constraints, I try to work with those constraints by giving myself additional constraints. And so I think of the synopsis as a constraint. 
Um, I think of the script as a constraint. I think of the little thumbnail page as a constraint. And I don't want to be frustrated by my process, but I want to see, oh, what can I do within this space? If this is, if these are my limitations, or rather reframe my ideas around this, this isn't a limitation so much. These are just my materials. This is what I have available to me at this time. Um, and so what can I do within this that's cool and interesting and surprising? Um, and so, uh, um, and so that's sort of how I approach the entire kind of writing process. And I think of the page design, I don't actually, I think of everything before I've drawn is just material for the comic, but not the actual comic itself. The synopsis is not the comic, the script is not the comic. The, th the little quick thumbnail sketch, that's kind of like the beginning of the comic there. And then the, the larger thumbnail sketches are the comic um, coming further into realization. Um, but I revisit it over and over uh, again. It's a very long, sort of tedious process to me, um, which I don't really mind. I kind of enjoy doing something slowly a little bit at a time, as long as there isn't somebody emailing me to check on my progress because I'm late or something. So. Um, but I, I, I can stop there. Cool, thank you so much, Jared. That was really fantastic. Um, so I am going to uh, now open things up to, to questions um, from uh, the audience and from pan if panelists have questions for each other. Um, so if you wanna ask a question, there are two ways. One is you can click on the raise your hand button in the participant section of the Zoom screen. And um, we can call on you and you can ask your question verbally, or if you want, you can um, ask a question in the chat. Um, the, uh, we do have um, a first question in the chat, which I had and now I've lost it. Um, and the, the question is from, from Bryant asking, um, what strategies have you found to help best share your work online to an audience outside friends and family? Is it all about gaming the Twitter algorithm? I'm not sure if anybody wants to, to take that first. I, I, would, I was like, do I unmute myself? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, again, my brain doesn't work in a way where I can sort of game like the internet algorithm. Um, that's not really something that like makes sense. Uh, my mind palace kind of short circuits when I try and get that figured out. Uh, so for me, um, you know, maybe it's not the most like mathematically effective way, but for me, it's just share what you want to share and you know don't be scared because sometimes it is really hard to put yourself out there and be vulnerable um, but if you you know just be brave and put yourself out there and make the work that you want to make your audience is going to find you whether or not the algorithm feels like working in your favor that's just how i feel anyway yeah i the older i get um the significantly less interested i am in the internet <laughs> and putting myself on the internet um so i don't really i've never really been the kind of person that made stuff that's super like that that seems to draw like a and i don't mean this in a self-deprecating way or anything like that but it just seems like it's always been more of a like a, a niche kind of thing which honestly i love i love to be niche um so I, that's never really been, I, you know, when I was like younger, I used to be like, oh, I want to get followers or, you know, whatever. But like, I kind of just do stuff for myself and then forget that I have a public Twitter and then like throw a bunch of blaze ball drawings up on my public Twitter and then don't look at it again for a month. So like, <laughs> that's sort of my process. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add to it. I'm not, it's not a huge consideration for me. Um, but I do think of like my Twitter, which is what I use mostly as a, my participation in a community. And so um, I'm mostly interacting with other people making children's books with a lot of teachers and a lot of librarians. And so, um, you know, I guess when I go there, I'm sort of mindful of who I'm talking to and what I'm speaking with. And of course, you know, thinking about what is it that I'm putting out into the world, but it's not, it does not occupy a ton of space in, <laughs> mentally for me and what I'm doing. I'm sort of thinking about what are my internet friends who are online on Twitter right now, and who, are, who am I talking to or what's going on? 
Uh, and if I share something, I'm usually thinking about like those people like, hey, you guys look at this thing I made or what do you think? You know, that sort of thing. So maybe like it's part of it is like expanding that like circle that you might consider like friends or family or like part of your community so that like your yeah yeah but i guess how do you make friends in real life if you try to make friends and nobody wants to be your friend because you're like that weirdo trying to make friends so right you just like you find these people and you connect and you know a handful of them sort of stick around or something i don't know sure um so uh we have a few questions few like few more questions um already in in the queue and we're going to try to get to to all of them um so i think alex uh you had a question. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, my name's Alex, uh, they, them. Um, I learned about this panel from Yasmin, so big shout out to Yasmin. Um, uh, so one thing I've been thinking is um, I'm an artist who, like Yasmin, and I think Remus uh, writes kind of about chronic health stuff, trauma, etc. And, you know, the hope is always that that will resonate with other people. Um, but what I've learned from friends who do that kind of work is also that sometimes you get people who want to share kind of their own um, trauma and stuff that, you know, your work evokes for them. And that can sometimes be kind of triggering to yourself. How do you kind of navigate um, that and maybe setting boundaries once, you know, that happens? And that's all. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, that is a great question. Also, hello. Good to see you. Um, so for me personally, because I wrote a lot about like my experience and my trauma having epilepsy, as you may know, um, for me, it was very much a matter of putting my experiences into a fictional character. So I had a bit of space away from it because doing sort of like an autobio, kind of putting my face right out there. It was, like you said, it was too much. It was like very triggering and like I couldn't distance myself and sort of compartmentalize it. So putting distance between like your exact experience and sort of like a, a narrative really helped me a lot because you also take a step back and you realize like, oh, okay, you can realize things that you wouldn't be able to realize if you were just doing like your face straight at the camera. Um, other than that, I would say if it's if it's so triggering that you feel like you can't make your comic, then, you know, step back a little bit. It doesn't have to be one to one. Like, of course, there's going to be certain feelings when you put your trauma on paper um, or on digital paper also. Um, but, you know, there's a certain point where if it's so much that you kind of start dreading making the comic, step back, stay, you know, you got to stay comfortable overall. You know what I mean? Okay. I hope that helps. Do uh, Remus or Jared, do you have anything to add to that or? I mean, I think I'm similar to um, Delta where like it's, I don't really, I don't really do autobiographical stuff. I sort of intentionally, even when I'm doing very autobiographical stuff, I very intentionally obscure it, um, such as by making it about Jughead from Riverdale. Um, so I, I, that's just not, I haven't necessarily had that. But I think I also, because I'm a teacher, I get like a similar, and I, I get like a similar, I, I teach college students, so they tend to be more, um, they're sort of trained to share trauma um, to, because they think the only way that they can get like help is to like share their trauma. Um, so I feel like I sort of have a similar thing with that and like making comics where I'm like very just like, um, I kind of give off an energy that is like, you don't need to share, it's fine. <laughs> Which isn't maybe a helpful answer, but it is, I feel like true. <laughs> I had a professor in college who um, w told me once, uh, he was an art ed professor and he said, um, I came to him to talk to him about some things. We were sort of talking, we had developed a kind of sort of friendship. We we're talking about things. He was like, look, I'm not a um, like mental health professional. I'm not really, really I'm not qualified to sort of deal with these sorts of things here. And I don't want to do any harm, but 
I can talk to you about your art. So, you know, put it in your art and let's talk about your art. And that, that was really useful for me um, as a teacher that I'm not qualified always to help my students and I don't know how to help all the time, but I do know how to talk about stories and storytelling and characters and those kinds of things. And, you know, whatever help you can offer, right? In, in whatever capacity you're able to, that's not putting you in harm's way or causing you to harm, so. Yeah, and I think that's a nice way to think about it in terms of the comics too, because that's like, here's a story that we can sort of talk about without it necessarily having to be rooted in like your per intensely personal or my intensely personal like stuff. Cool, thanks for the question, Alex. Um, so our next question is from Joe who asks, do any of the panelists have tips for managing the difference between a single page comic, maybe four to 10 panels start to finish versus a multi-page comic? And I assume that they mean in terms of like, like writing them. I, I wish I did, but unfortunately I don't really do many one page comics. So I wish that I could offer anything, but unfortunately I can't, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't do a ton of really short comics. I do do some short stories and um, I don't usually script out short stories. Um, I usually just kind of like run at it and sort of see what I can get done. Um, and so, uh, so when it, my process, the process I shared is more about managing a long term narrative that I'm going to be working on for a couple of years because it's just not possible to remember all of that in this story and I don't want to be responsible for trying to remember that. And so the script and the notes and the outline, those are all sort of memory helping devices for me. And so when it comes to short comics, I'm usually making them because I want to just make something quick that is all feeling and uh, and so I'll just sort of like throw something at it and just try to make it. And so those are, that's my main difference between those two processes. Remus, do you have anything to add? I, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't think very hard about, um, the I, the longer it is, the more effort I put into it, but that's really, in terms of the writing, but that's really about it. Cool. I think sometimes, like, especially if you're just starting out, like doing short, very short comics that like, if you do them and then you don't like them, that's okay because you didn't spend too much time on them and you can just like put them away somewhere, right? Like, um, yeah, in fact, you probably should do a lot of short comics that are awful when you're starting out because that's really, you know, yeah, low stakes and then you move on, you get better, so. Cool. So we have a, a question from Chris. Hey, everybody. Uh, so my question is about the transition from like a script to your thumbnails. Uh, any tips or approaches on getting the, uh, the script into sort of a, a, a good page that has like good beats and ends on a strong note at the end of every page? Uh, sort of, I guess, working on a multi-page comic. Sorry, if I may. Um, I know I said that I didn't write a script, but I guess I could kind of speak to sort of how I figure out the dialogue and the scene flow. Um, and I would say, uh, it's not, I would say don't even limit yourself to a page like ending on a nice beat and sort of like wrapping up on the end of a page, I would say um, just go with the feeling. And if the page isn't necessarily ending on a beat, then that's okay. Um, for me, it's very much um, like what feeling does this page want to convey? So it's not necessarily about um, being specifically like end on a beat or things like that. It's more just about, it's not even about what's the most important information that needs to go on the page, which I know is a lot of people's approach and it's a very good approach. For me, it's what is the most powerful feeling on the page or what are the most uh, important words that someone is saying on the page. And that's how I go about pacing and in my like style laying out the comic. Yeah, I think I'm pretty similar. I'm really, um, I'm really less, I'm more interested in like feeling like sort of what uh, Delta was talking about right so I'm and I'm my like paneling is very like 
um, inspired by shoujo manga, which is a lot more like things tend to be slow and there's more of an emphasis on like facial expressions and like really like holding on these like moments of um, feeling between characters. Um, so I just sort of like, I'm more interested in like, what are the feelings I'm trying to convey and then kind of working from there. But I also honestly don't think, I'm not super like obsessive about the pages being perfect, especially in the thumbnailing stage. Um, Cause like, the, th like the, the goal of the thumbnails is just to sort of figure out like as a block, as like a whole, what the flow is. Um, and then like individual things can be moved around or shuffled or like combined or pulled apart from there. But like, it's just sort of that first essential like feeling and flow for the whole thing. Yeah, when I, for, when I do my first pass of a script, I don't even break it into pages. It's just like this long running story. And then before I start drawing it, I go back in and I'm looking for kind of like natural pauses or natural moments. And what I usually find is that there's way too much to put on, an, on a single page in those scenes and in those moments. So it's again about cutting and cutting down um, and trying to sort of distill the story into, I'm telling sort of usually like adventure stories with monsters and fighting. And I have to tell this whole story in like 10 or 15 pages because each chapter is its own story. And so I'm really, really conscious of how much space I have on the page and how to get the information that I need to be on that page on that page um and then you know feeling through like oh is this ending in a weird spot like there's a call there's a return the return happens on the next page there's going to be you know writing for children too so I don't want anything to interrupt comprehension either and so those kinds of things but I, I'm really amazed the better the longer I've been cartooning just how you much you can really manipulate a page to get what you need on that page too and so um, again I try to like save those visual design aspects for when I'm sitting down to do the visual design of my page and I'm really thinking about manipulating space um, and how to get what I need where I need it and so there's nothing that can't be moved or edited or changed to make it work. Cool. Thanks for the question, Chris. Um, and so our next question is from Lainey. Hello. Hi. Um, so my question is about, um, basically, my, my process is really si similar to Yasmin's, um, which is, which is, um, works for me except that uh, I also come from an English background like Remus and so I kind of crave getting edits or like getting outside perspectives and that's harder to get when my my process is all about having these tiny scribbly thumbnails and then the dialogue sort of written underneath them and so I was wondering if there's like an amount that I should like try to clarify my thumbnails to get edits from other people or if they're I don't know, just any advice you have about that. <laughs> so um, for me, like what I presented, I know it didn't show up really, really big, but I think I kind of showed like at the end sort of this is what it looks like. For me, basically it's whatever is just barely readable, <laughs> like just enough for the other person to be able to read. And um, I actually turned in like those really rough, like thumbnail slash pencils, I turned into my publisher. So I have like my publisher reading like these really like quick scribbly like pencils essentially. So I would say it might be, you might have to kind of fight a little bit to clean up, but you don't have to clean up too much. I would say just enough. And if the other person can't really read it very well, then you can work it out <laughs> or get some <laughs> other kind of perspective um, in a way that like someone is a bit more uh, like resonating with your level of detail slash lack of it. I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, I think like I kind of, I have a pass that's for me. And then if I'm sending it to someone like my agent, I do a second pass for them, which is the one that they, I know they can read. Um, but if it's just something that I'm doing for myself, I just stay at the me pass. Um, and I'm just lucky that uh, one of my friends that I've known for a very long time, we've been sort of reading each other's work for so long that like I can give them scribbles and they're like, okay, I understand what you're doing. <laughs> but yeah, that's sort of my approach. 
Yeah, that was a big challenge for me. My first book with a publisher, I sent them my thumbnails and they handed it back to me and said, I can't read any of this. And it was getting to learn like, oh, right, I'm, I have to like check in with other people now. And so, but I, I, I think of the, the thumbnails are a tool, right? The tool to helping you finish your comic. If your pencil was dull, you would sharpen it. If your nib was out of ink, you would redip it. If your thumbnails can't be read, you got to clean them up a little so somebody, so that they can function in the way that you need them or want them to function. And so, um, but now I just, I go a little bit slower on my first time so that I don't have to redo them later. I still inevitably have to redo, redo some. And the text that I type into my page is in part to send to my editor because my handwriting would be terrible. So concessions, I guess. Uh, thanks so much for the question, Lainey. Um, next question is from Gigi. Welcome. Hi, my name is Gigi. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and my question is about what your routines or rituals are before you start writing. Uh, lately, I have been doing a lot of listening to audiobooks and podcasts about how to create uh, a space where you can create deep work. Um, and I know since we were talking about neurodiversity, I know everybody's process is not the same. So I was just curious, um, especially since uh, social media was brought up earlier, and that can be like a big distractor for artists and writers. But I was wondering, what is your each individual's process or like routine rather, like before you start writing, what gets you in the headspace to start uh, creating? This is so, like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> Um, I love, this is a really great question. Um, my, so when my roommate and I, we moved, we had to move in the middle of the pandemic and we moved, um, and we both, we're both in the same cohort. We are in the same, um, grade. So we, we, we sort of deliberately set up a working space in our apartment for us, um, which is really nice because like my brain doesn't work if I try to like work in the same place I like sleep or I try to like work in the same place I like eat. Like I have to have like a very clear separation. Um, and we have a patio. So even though I can't like, my usual my usual ritual honestly is um, going to a coffee shop. I live at coffee shops. When I did my master's, I, um, I think I like stayed at the same coffee shop for a week. This was uh, a while ago. Um, <laughs> so the fact that I can't do that has been very distressing for me. But the patio is like outside enough that I can kind of like, life hack it and pretend that I'm not in my apartment anymore. Um, I don't have any like specific, like I usually, I'm like a morning, I'm like more of a morning person. So I usually like prefer to work. I don't like working before noon. Um, I, I, those two statements contradict each other. I get up, but then I don't like working before noon. And then I am obsessively on Twitter, but that's okay. Like I need to kind of like constantly be checking other things. Like I can't just like focus on something for long. It's like the ADHD brain. Um, so I just sort of give myself permission to jump around a lot. <laughs> and I also can't listen to music because um, if I'm writing, it's like this weird thing where if I'm listening to something with words, I can't write. Like my, my brain just will be like, no words. So I, I actually am like the opposite of most people where I, I need like white noise and not music, <laughs> but that's what I do. Ah, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you in this. Um, so for me, I don't really have a, a ritual, um, but I definitely do have to stretch before I start working um, just because I do have like muscle tightness from, you know, just kind of like bad posture. So definitely stretch um, is what I do. And um, like for me, the thing that like gets me like ready to go, honestly, is just listening to video game music. <laughs> I have some good like soundtracks or some like mixed playlists that I just put on because like it gets me sort of in that creative space and as soon as I started listening to that stuff like it just gets me like really inspired um so that's kind of like like I'm ready to go when I start doing that so um also like I'm part of like a discord group of my friends um that's like very uh, supportive and inspiring and we're always like like lifting each other up really positively so I know that like checking your phone might seem counterintuitive, but kind of like checking up on those messages before I start working is really nice because it's very like inspiring um, and just like, cool, like we can do this. You know what I mean? So. 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't have a, a I spent a lot of time when I was first starting out as a writer trying to figure out what my like writing ritual would be like, believing that writing was a kind of like sort of mystical process that required like the right space, the right time, the right things. Um, and it never really worked out for me, but that's sort of what you always heard these romantic notions of like how it worked. Um, and because I've always made comics kind of on the side, on the side of my job, on the side of my family, you know, I, when my kids go to sleep, I develop just the habit of little pieces here and there, just a little bit here, a little bit there, whenever I can, not being really precious about my materials or where, where I can work. I could work, I'll, I'll make a comic with any materials anywhere if I have to. Um, and so um, once I sort of embraced that, these things, not as limitations, but again, it's just part of my process and how I work, it became a lot easier for me to just find these little moments here or there. Sometimes I'm drawing comics when I'm sitting in car line when my kids were at school, uh, to picking them up from school or whatever it is. And so um, I would say drinking coffee before, but I drink coffee nonstop all day long. So it's not really a ritual anymore at this point. Um, but I do listen to music when I write and I do listen to like documentaries or podcasts where um, uh, not where people are reading things they've written, but like more conversational or, or investigative ones while I'm inking because I, I want to like just kind of zone out and just draw at that point. So those are the two things that I do do regularly. But other than that, no real process, uh, consistent one. Oh, great question, Gigi. Um, so I did want to check in. We are at the one hour mark. Um, we have three more questions. I just want to be like mindful of, of everybody's time. I know uh that like remus you mentioned that like you have a strict like sleeping schedule and we don't want to like mess with that i also don't want to put I'm you on fine. the spot no that's fine no you're right i do turn into a pumpkin at 10 o'clock but it, we've got a little bit of time okay uh, yasmin and, and jared are you okay with this? yeah yeah covering okay. these last three questions okay great um so the next question is from heather k Hi, I'm Heather, she, her, and thanks for staying around. Um, my question is about collaboration. Uh, the In your talks at the beginning, which were all really amazing, mostly everyone talked about their process uh, of being both the writer and the artist on, on the work that they were doing. And I'm wondering if any of you have experience and some tips on when that's not the case if you're the writer and someone else is drawing or uh, someone else wrote and you need to draw it like does that change anything about how you work or, or the the tools you use and the way you function oh so for me um personally everyone is different as far as like collaboration who they collaborate with but for me to collaborate with someone um, i have to know them pretty well and kind of already have a dynamic um, I think a lot of that is just because like I have a lot of health problems so, like I kind of need to like have someone who sort of knows me more and kind of knows what's up and can work with me a bit more personally to make sure like my health is in check and everything like that. So I tend to when it comes to collaboration I tend to work with people who I already know or people that I know are going to be like good to me in that way. So what's really important for me in collaboration is like a good back and forth and like an open space to kind of like um, like exchange ideas. So when it comes to that in general, both me and whoever I'm working with have a pretty like even amount of input back and forth. So I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I hope that that helps in some way. <laughs> Basically, I guess like working with people that you know you can have like a good like relationship with and that you both can put good stuff into, like that's kind of how I handle that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't write for other people, um, just because it's such a difficult, like, thing for me to do, um, that, like, the added pressure of, like, and then I have to show this to a person, and they have to translate it, like, I shut down. Um, I have, like, drawn for other people before, and in those, like, relationships, it has, like, it does have to be, like, um, I mean, I've done some, like, freelance stuff, and that's been okay, but, like, I'm not, really a huge fan of that um I prefer to either like 
if either do my own stuff or like collaborate in a more like horizontal dialogic way where it's not so much like a clean delineation of like I'm doing this and you're doing I'm doing the writing and you're doing the art but more like we're kind of contributing to both um which is not, which is like not I know like the like standard way to do it I guess but like yeah I'm just not I'm like I don't have like, like I don't have like a good temperament I think for that kind of freelance pipeline <laughs> Yeah, I haven't actually done any collaborative comics with anybody. Um, I would like to, I just, I'm so slow at drawing. I can only kind of draw one thing at a time and I would probably rather draw my thing. And so than someone else's thing. I would write and for somebody else, and uh, but I haven't done it, so. Well, thanks for the question, Heather. Um, the next question is from Courtney, um, who, uh, I'm, you have your uh, hand raised, so I'm not sure if you want to ask it verbally or if you want me to. Um, okay, so um, the question is, so we talked about earlier, um, if, if writing the traditional way is difficult for you, um, how might you suggest using your quirky ways to get something together to pitch to a publisher? I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's okay, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I, since I, I, my examples were of the pitch I was working on, I feel like I, I've been in this headspace. Um, I, letting myself be slow is like a really big part of that. Like, I feel like, I know, <laughs> I feel like um, I, I feel, especially like in the beginning, because I've been working on this pitch for, um, God, like three years now. And in the beginning, I felt like a lot of pressure, right? To be like, oh, but I want to get it done and I want to get it out and like this and this and this. And luckily my agent um, is also a person with chronic illness and was just like, you're not on a timeline. <laughs> like you don't actually have to, you don't have to move fast. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. Um, so, cause, cause like, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm ever gonna be the kind of person who can be like, oh, and here's like a banged out polished script. Um, and they know that because um, I've told them that. Um, so just like kind of having like that communication and then also like giving myself time and doing a lot of like uh, scribbling stuff out and then being like, is this anything to my friends? And like looking at like what the kind of stuff they're doing and like borrowing from them is sort of how I get there, I think. Yes. Um, so in my case, how I kind of, you know, I um, have like a deal with a publisher where I'm signed for two books. Um, putting that pitch together was kind of like you, you have to have a script for this particular pitch. Like you have to. And I was like, oh, I was like, okay. Um, so in that particular case, what I did is I drew for myself and did everything visually backwards. So I kind of like, thumbnailed and drew out the characters and sort of like did my own process but then I wrote the script off of that because it was completely necessary um and so I did that and now since I'm contracted for two books for the second one I don't have to do that so um if you can get sort of into a zone where you have to pitch to like a publisher or whoever you've already worked with then they can kind of be more familiar with the process and you probably won't have to do that again but just initially like if you have to write a script, I just do everything kind of backwards. I hope that helps. Wow, the backwards writing, that's uh, an extra step in that process, yeah. I have, I've thankfully not been in a position where I've been asked to make something that's outside of my normal process from an editor yet. Um, but the, except for the pitch kind of document itself, which is kind of weird and awkward and includes like a synopsis about your, I don't, I don't usually write, decide what my story is in advance before I've created it. It's more, a little more emergent for me. And so, um, but I think if you think about it in terms of like uh, writing in a genre, like if you were writing a resume or something like that, like, you know what, this is a document with a function. And so knowing what its function is and who its audience is can help you remember like, okay, this isn't like my art and my soul right here. This is a functional document that has like a, a job to do. And the job is to like convey this information to somebody who doesn't know me and doesn't know anything about me. And so kind of removing yourself from it a little bit, like this isn't me, but this is just a, a, 
the tool that has a particular function can sort of be helpful. And looking at examples of other people's pitches was really helpful to me also. Cool. Uh, thank you for that question, Courtney. Um, and our, the final question for the night is um, from Vernon. Um, hey, thanks for sticking around. Um, and thank you for letting me ask the last question. Um, you all seem to um, have a lot of really cool characters and like to, and I think a few of you mentioned like starting with uh, original characters or characters you really love from other properties, but I was wondering if you had any tips for uh, people for developing characters um, in the writing process. Hello, Vern. How are you doing? I'm so glad you, you asked the question. Um, so for me, basically, it's like coming up with a concept for a character can be very slow, but I would say a really good way to do it is sort of like take an aspect of like your personality that you aren't really like necessarily in touch with or a part of it that you're still kind of exploring or having a conversation with and kind of start your character with that a part of yourself that maybe you could understand more another way to do it is sort of like a part of other people that you would like to understand more um, and like their perspectives and things like that and once you start to build a character sort of up from that i find that characters themselves tend to grow into themselves so as you start writing the character they almost kind of like become their own like person or you know whatever it is if it's person or non-human or machine um, they tend to sort of grow up in their own way. And then you'll find yourself writing the character and you're like, when did you become like this? <laughs> so I think that if you keep being in conversation with your own character, when you find like their core, uh, that's really going to start to grow. And eventually you're going to know your character really well. I know it's kind of abstract, but I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, I, I think of, it's like, I think about, I've never been like an OC person, so to speak. Um, I tend to think about characters more in terms of like uh, their function to the story, which is very English major of me, I realize. Um, but the other thing is I, a lot of what I do is just like uh, ripped off autobiography and most of my main characters are just like filtered versions of myself, um, which makes it easy because it's like I know myself pretty well. And but but what I usually do is like I think about like core core motivations or core traits and kind of build out from there um so like and also i think about and this is something i picked up from a friend actually but i think about characters in pairs like i don't often come up with a standalone person and then like try to build a story out from them it's normally um it's normally like at least two or three people in some sort of synchronicity and then the story builds out from like what is their relationship um and then making playlists is the other one <laughs> making playlists for specific characters or specific relationships <laughs> that is the other move <laughs> yeah i'm a sketchbook doodler and so i like to just draw things in my sketchbook and draw lots of characters and every now and then actually very similar to what Yasmin was talking about every now and then a character will be on my sketchbook and I'll be like oh who is this and I have some more questions and I keep drawing that character and like a year later I'm still drawing that character and starting to put them in scenes and hear their voice and it gets to a point where I'm like I need this character in a story because I just I want to see what happens and so um but I spend a, like a year or two usually on a character who ends up in like a long book will be like a year or two in development of me just drawing them over and over and over again and trying out different materials and because also you know different pens render your lines differently and sometimes that character takes on a whole new form when you use a brush pen versus you know a nib pen or from working digitally and so just spending a lot of time with that character when I'm like where I feel like okay I can spend a long time I could spend a year or two telling a story about this character and I feel like I know them and also as Yasmin said they take on a life of their own and you don't have to make those decisions anymore because you'll write a scene and it's not up to what you want to happen because that character can only do a certain will only respond in a certain way their agencies move them in such a direction that this is who they are and how they react so thank you oh cool, yeah uh, thanks for that question, Vernon, and um, thanks so much. Uh, 
Yasmin and Remus and Jared for your presentations and your insight tonight. Um, and all of these questions were really fantastic. I'm so glad that we were able to, to include all of them. Um, I am going to paste in links to um, the artists, um, the presenters' web pages. Um, please um, visit them, check them out, um, support them as directly as you can. Their comics make great holiday gifts. Um, they make great everyday gifts. Um, uh, and um, so I, I wanted to um, let everybody know that Radiator Comic Studio has one more event uh, in the year 2020. And that's um, this Friday, December 11th. We're hosting our weekly uh, work event, Open Studio. We open up our Zoom room uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for you to make time for your comics, to like work on your comics. Um, the afternoon is broken up into four 20-minute uh, quiet work sessions during which you're concentrating on your comics. And then we take 10-minute breaks um, between each quiet work session so you can socialize or stretch your legs. Um, you'll meet other cartoonists, some of whom are regulars, are here uh, today with us um, in the audience. Um, and um, you'll get stuff done. It's a lot of fun. Um, all experience levels are welcome. Um, and then after this Friday, we're taking the next two Fridays off, but Open Studio will return on January 1st, 2021. So you can start your year off right, working on your comics, getting stuff done. Um, and then we're planning a ton of new programming for the new year too. So um, please keep an eye out for that. Um, also, we have copies of uh, Sun and Sand comic anthology, which was co-published with Black Jose Press. Um, uh, it features 10 wonderful comics about South Florida. Hey, Jared's got it right there. Um, uh, there it's all by local cartoonists. Um, it's uh, beautifully printed by KSY Press. And if you go to sunsandcomics.wordpress.com, you can read the comics online for free. You can download a PDF for free. And if you're willing to cover the shipping and handling of $2, um, we will send you, we can send you a copy in the mail. Uh, so um, yeah, that's another initiative from Radiator Comic Studio. But um, yeah, I hope everybody's holidays are warm and bright and that your new year starts off with um, joy and promise. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again to Yasmin and to Remus and to Jared. And thank you all for joining us and your, your wonderful questions. Everybody, please stay safe um, and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank thanks, you, Neil. Thank you, Remus and thank Jared. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.